Dr. Malachi Martin, ex-Jesuit, former exorcist, and one-time advisor to three popes, is currently a best-selling author. As a premier investigator of clandestine politics and unlikely alliances of popes and cardinals, his novels offer rare insights into the men who guide nearly a billion people in faith and broker the destinies of countries and continents. As a member of the Vatican Intelligence Network, I didn't know they had one, under Pope John the Twenty-Third, Martin helped extend the church into Iron Curtain countries in 1964, concerned about the corrupting influences of power. Martin was released from his vows of poverty and obedience after 25 years as a Jesuit. He left Rome for New York, where he did odd jobs until a Guggenheim Fellowship enabled him to write his first bestseller, Hostage to the Devil. It was followed by the final conclave, Vatican, Three Popes and the Cardinal, the Keys of This Blood, the Jesuits, and apparently many others. Here is Dr. Malachi Martin. Doctor, welcome to the program. Very good morning, Dad. How are you? Oh, I am very well, and I am so honored to have you here. Many years ago now, I, I, you can tell me how many. Yeah. The movie The Exorcist came out. Yeah. It was the first of its kind, really, major movies, and yeah. it scared the hell out of me. I find that very curious. I really do. And I think the reason is because I viewed The Exorcist as real. Yes, I think so. And it did touch on a chord, the existence of demon, which could, on occasion, inhabit the body of some other human, of some human being. I think that might be the element. And it was set also. That particular picture was set in Washington, real lifetime Washington. And uh, you had real live-looking characters undergoing these horrible contortions and distortions. The fact is, at the back of our consciousness, at least in, uh, I was going to say in the West, but then I, I know it's the same in India, it's the same in China, it's the same in, in Japan, uh, and in Latin America. At the back of our consciousness, there's always a fear of the evil one. Let me start there by asking you, is there a difference between possession by the devil and possession by a demon there is the mythology or the legend or the doctrine or the teaching whichever you want to regard it as it holds that there is a major evil spirit called lucifer and there is another one called satan they are accompanied by or they are among many many smaller demons and these do attack and possess human beings in their will and their intellect. That's the general sort of picture you get from books and studies and doctrine and teaching about the devil and about evil. I think at the edge of our consciousness there's always the fear that perhaps indeed there is such a thing if That's we don't right. believe it. We Catholics do hold it and Christians in general do hold it. But there's a consciousness that there's some evil spirit at work. It could be in our world. And we're afraid of it. And that it can, according to the belief in many parts of the world and in many parts of history of man, there is the possibility of being possessed, of one's body being dominated by such an evil spirit and used for nefarious ends. Is the devil a fallen angel? That's the idea. They are all fallen angels. The idea is that once upon a time, one-third of the angels of God revolted against him and were condemned to hell and became demons. The purpose of the rebellion was simply the ambition of one spirit, Lucifer, the son of the dawn, that's what his name means, the light bearer or the son of the dawn, who said, I will not serve, I will be equal to God. And he was opposed by one spirit who said, who is like unto God? And that's the name of Michael, Mikael, who is like unto God. And there was this, supposedly, this huge battle between the spirits, and the demons lost. And Michael and those fighting for God won. And forever the fallen angels, those who rebelled, are condemned to hell, and condemned to be evil and to promote evil amongst human beings. How do we, human beings, fit into the picture? It's almost as though the war is over human beings. 
Yes, it is over human beings. The teaching is that once upon a time God envisaged the world inhabited by men and women and served by angels. But when Lucifer and Satan and the other demons, then angels, were asked to collaborate and cooperate and serve human beings, especially one particular human being who would be God, namely Christ Jesus of Nazareth, they said, no, we are angels, we are superior to these material beings. We haven't got their limitations and we don't die. We are pure spirits. They were destined originally to serve human beings and they refused. Doctor, when did you become, how old were you when you became a priest? I was 33. 33. 33, and it, that was in 1954. How many exorcisms have you done? I've done thousands of minor exorcisms and about a couple of hundred major ones. Major ones uh, in duration and in intensity. Very difficult, and they are far fewer than the thousands of exorcisms you do every year. Exorcisms against various ailments like, uh, for instance, a persecution a complex, uh, where you're really being obsessed by a devil or a demon, mm -hmm. or alcoholism, or as is, is the human ills, the list is enormous. Now, I first of all came across it in Cairo. That was the first time that I assisted at an exorcism. I originally started off as an archaeologist, and I was an expert in ancient handwriting about the time of Abraham. That's about 1700 B.C. But I was roped in one evening because an exorcism which was taking place in the poorer quarter of Cairo, the assistant to the exorcist, there's always an exorcist and an assistant, the assistant had fallen ill, and I was asked to substitute. And that was my first experience. My understanding is the Catholic Church does not lightly undertake to do an exorcism. No. no How does it decide? It decides this way. It's, uh, all right, so somebody comes to the church authorities and saying, look, my uncle, my brother, my wife, my sister, whatever it is, they are showing very funny signs. Usually in every good, well-run diocese, there's an exorcist, that is a priest appointed by the local bishop to deal with this. So the first thing you do is examine them, get them examined by a doctor, and find out are they physically sound. There are ailments like Latourette syndrome, or Huntington's chorea, or a simple tumor on the brain, which produces phenomena, produces events in a person's life that look very like possession, but are not. So you must first of all satisfy yourself that there's nothing physical, no physical basis. Then one or two expert psychiatrists Usually people who don't believe in God, by the way, mm -hmm. because they're, they're skeptical, must tackle you and find out, are you just plain loony, or is there something they don't understand? And sure. They come back with a report saying, well, the pattern is normal, we can't explain it. Then the church authorities generally say, okay, let's try exorcism. In the first 20 minutes, everybody at an exorcism knows whether it's genuine or not. It's quite clear. In the longest or the hardest exorcisms, how long typically might it go on? The classic one in the United States was about two and a half years long. Two and a half years? Two and a half years, yeah. So it's been written up very recently by a, a simple reporter who simply chronicled the entire thing. But I've existed at ones which went on for, oh, 17 weeks. Sometimes it's only a week. Sometimes it's only hours. It depends on the tenacity of the demon in possession. It depends on the antecedents of the person. It depends on so many factors, you, you just can't predict. You go into it blind in that sense. So the majority of possessions are by demons. That's right, they are. All true possession is by demons. Now, you see, there's a distinction between possession and obsession. Obsession is where somebody is being bothered continually by, for instance, cases I have in hand at the present moment of people who are bothered continually by appearances of animals with human faces or pressures on them at night when they want to go to sleep and funny faces and funny things happening to them. When you rationalize it all and have the person examined physically and mentally, you come to the conclusion there are objective events taking place and they are being bothered and obsessed by a demon, and then you set about chasing that demon away. 
of those that have gone past the medical doctor and yes. the psychiatrists, yes. what percentage would you say turn out to be actual cases of possession? About 80%. Then I would also ask, you said examined by two psychiatrists who right. do not necessarily believe in God. Generally, I have always tried to use the services and the skills of psychiatrists who will tell you I'm an atheist. I really don't believe in practically in God. Well, they're not influenced, therefore, by any prejudice. I've only found one or two psychiatrists who wanted to assist at an exorcism, and generally, one of them I wrote about, Dr. Hammond, he simply gave up all psychiatry once he went into the real thing. How many people who thought they were possessed were diagnosed, in your opinion, incorrectly by psychiatrists who might tend to, because of their own prejudice, uh, want to claim this uh, apparent malady as, uh, as their own territory? Uh, so how many never made it to you because they were incorrectly diagnosed? A very great number, especially when we come down to a thing called MPDs. It's, a, it's an abbreviation used by psychiatrists for multiple personality disorders. That is, you know, say, let's take the name Hilda, and Hilda says that she becomes Mary in certain occasions, right. then she becomes Joan on other occasions, right. and she becomes Geraldine on third occasion, you know, uh, multiple personality disorder. And um, for a long time, MPDs were simply analyzed as MPDs. And then, under certain circumstances, they began to find out that it was much more than that. Uh, it was a case of demonic possession. And that has to be very carefully distinguished because you, you can make a dreadful mistake and think a true MPD is possessed or vice versa, that a person really possessed is an MPD. Then I would ask, I guess, can a person be possessed by more than one entity? Oh, oh yes, and the same demon can possess three people at the same time. The variation is tremendous. This is a very dirty, unhealthy, inhuman, insalubrious, wicked, unnatural process and event. And nobody should touch it with a barge pole except somebody trained, and even then to be very careful because it's highly dangerous. For instance, if you start any nonsense, real exorcism, and a lot of people don't know the difference between that and therapy, the difference between that and prayer, uh, our healing prayer, deliverance prayer as they call it. Is there going to be an antichrist? Whether there is now is a question. There is going to be an Antichrist, and I think the best thing we can do is talk about his public appearance, because he may already be in existence. For me to say he is in existence would immediately provoke the questions, where is he and what is he doing? Yes. And I want to avoid that. Yes. But he will be manifest publicly within a reasonable amount of time. Most people who are 20-something or 30-something will come across Antichrist in their life. I'm 76. I may not. How will we know him? We will know him by two main qualities. First of all, he will arrive at a time when we as a race have what looks like insuperable problems. Supposing we discover we have insuperable, really insuperable environmental problems. Supposing we find we have insuperable health problems, a disease wasting nation after nation. That's the first thing. He will have solutions for those problems. He will have wise solutions, solutions that are real solutions. And number two, the result of his intervention, the results of his solutions will be such that people will say, you must be God. And he will accept that attribute. Those are the three marks of the Antichrist. There is in scripture and in tradition. By the way, I'm a Roman Catholic, so I have some, I'm not sort of dependent on the Bible as Protestants are, and that's their choice. But there is a thing called the mystery of iniquity. It's a, a very constant teaching of the Bible and of religious men and women, and it's this, that evil is allowed from time to time to so dull the senses of men and women and to so disturb the equilibrium of their minds that they do crazy, real crazy, mad, bad things. When a human being is possessed by a yes. demon, what is the purpose of the possession of an individual? The destruction of that individual's soul to such a point that it must end up in hell. 
hell being a place, an existence which is totally separate from God. The belief is that everybody was created to be happy forever. And God wants everybody to enjoy heaven, the joys of heaven, the perpetuity of heaven, the peace of heaven, and the ecstasy of heaven. The demons, excluded from that and barred from it because of their rebellion, want to make sure that as many human beings as possible don't attain it. And that is done by possession, and possession is a funny thing. It's a funny operation. It never starts suddenly. You don't wake up in the morning and say, gee whiz, I'm possessed. It doesn't happen like that. It's like any addiction. It's like anything that happens slowly. It's bit by bit. Bit by bit, I cede control of my will and my intellect to a demon. And one day, the possession is complete. Is this a fight, doctor, between an individual's will and that of the demon? Well, usually, uh, to be more accurate, it's a fight between the will of the exorcist and the will of the demon. I guess I meant before you or somebody like yourself has met yes. up with this possessed individual, yes. as the process of takeover is underway, yes. is it a fight? Yes, it is, between the person's will and the demon intending to possess. Usually, the tendency or the, the attempt to possess is through deception. We have, in the northeast corner of America, since 1975, we've had a huge increase in the following type of possession. A young man, say 30-something, 40-something, a young woman, will come and say, look, when I was in college, when I was studying, when I took up uh, residence as a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it was, I made a pact with the devil. I needed money. I needed a position. And I asked him to help me, and he did, but he took over my will and my mind. Now I want to get rid of it. How do I get rid of it? We have an increase in that phenomenon. Some of them don't even believe in God. Some of them are Jewish, some of them are Buddhist, some of them are Christian. Some of them are Protestants or Catholic. There's no profile of the possessable person. Once you have issued such an invitation, is there any way to go back? If it has been taken up, your only recourse is exorcism that we know of. There may be other recourses. We don't know of any recourse except that. Are there cases in which a possession is not Obvious. I would imagine there are many where the, uh, the spirit has simply won and is in firm control. I would think that uh, the people who come to you are those who are sort of in the middle of a giant battle. That's right. When you find some, you know, the typical things of somebody throwing themselves on the ground or cursing and spitting and protesting and desiccating, yes. urinating and all sorts of protest. What they're doing is protesting, saying, help me. The really, the perfectly possessed, we call them the perfectly possessed, are those that are completely at peace. I've known several of the perfectly possessed, and I avoid them like the pest. You know them only by almost accidental means. Sometimes, they're perfectly normal, by the way, and they've got great business property, they're married, they have children and wives, and they, they put down responsible jobs. There's nothing wrong there. Just now and again, it, as it were, a veil is drawn aside. And you see somebody you don't know at all. You just don't know this person, this man, this woman. And there's a completely alien look, a completely alien attitude. And they breathe alienation. You know then that uh, they're perfectly possessed and there's nothing to be done about it. The first man I knew like that was called John Beedham. And it was a frightening experience because I had known him for years. They are at peace with and comfortable with That's right. their That's deal. Right. That's right. And they have passed through the usual Satanist rituals too. The three Satanist rituals, the power of inflicting pain, the power of hating, and the power of burning fire. Fire is, a, is part of the Satanist and the Luciferian development. And they've passed through all those with flying colors. You mentioned that one psychiatrist simply gave up psychiatry. That's right. I gave him a code name of Hammond, but he was very, very uh, skeptical about it all. And uh, finally I said, okay, doctor, look, you insist, but uh, you must have some protection. He wasn't a Catholic, by the way, uh, but he was a very uh, honest, sincere man. And uh, he, once he went through it, uh, that was it. He would never touch another another possessed person. He would never touch psychiatry ever again. He went off and did something else. He was a qualified doctor and became an only MD. Doctor, how frequently do you think psychiatrists who are treating patients, mm -hmm. or what percentage of their patients might indeed, instead of uh, uh, suffering uh, psychiatric problems, mm -hmm. be suffering some form? Well over 50% are really possessed by demons, 
and of course nothing can be done about it. They're diagnosed as schizophrenic or as MPDs or as whatever. Uh, and there's no sucker for them. There is no sucker or help for them at all. When you have done your job and it's all over and the demon leaves, yes. where does that demon go? Let me gently but firmly put in a corrective there art from the point of view of an expert. The demon has been deprived of a place, a location, a human person in which to exercise power. Therefore, they're confined to what they were they originally were, which is a hell. They go back merely to suffering because their suffering is intense and perpetual and non-stop. They have had a chance of exercising power outside of their tortures. The evil they inflict is a way of their getting their own back in some way or other, even though it doesn't relieve their pain. So they are punished for their failure. That's right. They're punished. And that's why in the gospel, for instance, you have the evil spirit saying to Jesus, no, no, don't, don't, don't send us back to hell. Send us into these pigs. Do you remember the, the swine of Gerasene? They rushed over the precipice into the water and drowned themselves. They could possess something. There's a sort of relief, a temporary relief, in not being condemned purely and simply to suffer in hell. And therefore, they want something to inhabit. And Christ himself said, that, and St. Paul says, and St. Peter, and a lot of things in the New Testament say that the devil goes around seeking whom he may devour, like a lion, whom he may possess. I must tell you that the increase, the enormous increase, about 800% over what it used to be in our small area, because it's only a small area we do, the northeast corner, and it is a huge increase. And here's one more thing to say, Art, which may provoke a whole string of questions. Possession of the real diabolic kind is generational. It's passed on by training. It's a dreadful thing when somebody comes in who are perfectly respectable, good, normal American families, and they have reared their children to be Satanists and to accept possession, and they would, unless they're stopped, unless they're stopped themselves, pass it on to their children. And it's been going on for well over 200 years. Let me explain that. It's not that possession is passed on with semen, passed on with genes. No, no, no. The same demon inhabits the members of the same family for generations, consensually. He is nourished by them and kept by them and satisfied with them. The children are trained in it, and they perpetuate it in their children. It has gone on for generations. It's generational. And sometimes... Unwillingly, we have cases in hand, for instance, of daughters to whom their mother attached her familiar, her evil spirit, and then we have the job of ridding them of that. And it takes time, and it's painful, and anguishing. Is there always knowledge of that possession? There is, but it can be limited knowledge, and it can also be inhibited knowledge. Some of them can't even tell you about it. Some of them can. It depends on the particular type of demon. There are many types of demon. Some of them are quite intelligent. Some of them are very stupid. Most of them are specialized in one thing and one thing only. And that's all they can do. And it's a reflection of some gift as angels which they had, now distorted as demons. And in these matters, as in everything connected with it, go to the experts. Don't try and do it yourself. There's a big confusion art which we should clear up for everybody. There are many healers and deliverance experts, and many people will undergo lengthy prayers and incensings and various ceremonies. But the truth is this, that if there is a demon in your life and he dictates your behavior at least in one province of life, one area of life, he can only be expelled by direct confrontation by somebody with authority to expel him. Uh, so when I say him, of course, spirits have no sex. They're, they're not male or female. I just use him in the generic sense of the English word. It's the confrontation. It's not a prayer. Gee whiz, it was a prayer to be very simple to get rid of. If God hears our prayers, those cast yes. silently forward, yes. then why would God not hear a silent plea, a scream, as it were, why must something like this be audibilized? There are mysteries about this entire situation to which we have no answer. But he has set up laws governing the existence of man and woman. And one of them is that audibilizing something does make a difference. It can be as simple as this. 
that the attention that a demon requires of the possessed person or the person they're going to violate, that possession can be distracted, their will can be diverted, their mind can be diverted mm-hmm. from being, as it were, hypnotized, being held by uh, some audible voice message from an, another a normal human being. And God knows what grace of God that voice brings with them. But that it does happen, that audibilization does have an influence, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And there's no specific answer as to No what. specific answer. And you know, Art, there's the biggest problem is, who is possessible? And people are always asking me, am I, am I liable to be possessed? And we have tried to create a profile of the possessible person, but we have found that neither sex, nor education, nor color, nor race, nor education, nor riches, nor poverty, nothing makes a difference. It's random. I know very naughty people, and then I know people who are not naughty at all, but a lapse in one thing, and they do undergo possession. Knowing the nature of humans, if somebody has made, in effect, a pact with the devil, is it not more likely that those cases of possession would more frequently than not be the rich, the powerful, those who have attained great material success or wealth, You would think so, Art, but de de facto, no. No. Poor people, people with very little social resonance, people occupying very obscure positions in the social ladder, everybody is susceptible to some ambition, something they want, either for revenge or for self-satisfaction or for self-advancement. Everybody is liable. The pact could be something as simple as the wanting or the wishing of a a mate or the attention of somebody of the opposite sex or... That's it, right, to get married. To get to married. To get this man, to get this woman. Yes. There are many people walking around listening right now who are no doubt uh, scared to death because at one time or another in their life they have probably in a moment of despair yes. or a moment of need yes. said, I'd make a pact with the devil if I could just have yes. Yes. so-and-so. Yes. And they're probably uh, thinking at this moment, there's a pretty good chance they may be possessed. You can't be possessed without knowing it. And you can't be possessed against your will. You may uh, wish all day and all night for the devil to come and uh, sign a pact with you, as it were, a, a Faustian um, uh, thing, principle. But It can't happen without your knowing it and without you willing it fully, finally fully, bit by bit by bit, so that you needn't be afraid that you're possessed and you don't know it. No, 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 that that doesn't happen. Well, are there not, though, no doubt, many people who have achieved success or achieved that goal for which they made that dark wish, that, that moment, and they certainly must wonder. They know full well. And that's the darkest secret of their life. That sets them apart from wife or husband or lover or mistress or brother or sister. And And you say you have seen these people. You know these people when you see them. Oh, yes, you do. You you meet them in the street. You meet them in in cocktail parties. You meet them at dinner parties. You meet them at meetings and conventions. I get out of their way. I have enough of it. I don't want to confront them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Unless I have to professionally. Dr. Catholic priests, how many Catholic priests are capable of or do within the church exorcisms? Nowadays, Art, unfortunately, a minimum. As you know, in the last 25 or 30 years, belief in the devil, belief in evil incarnate, in uh, an evil spirit, belief in hell, belief in the demons, the existence, and the activity, say, of Lucifer and of Satan. They're distinct demons, by the way. People often confuse them, but they're distinct demons. Belief in that has flagged, has got very weak. Hmm. And the result is that when we started doing a lot of exorcisms here in the northeast corner of America in the 1970s, we finally had to go to Rome and ask permission because the local bishops, some of them didn't believe. So we went to Rome and said, look, these people, we need authority because, by the way, nobody can do an exorcism without being given authority. And it must be a bishop gives authority. So we had to go and get special permission from Rome to do it because we couldn't get it here. Now, some bishops do believe, some bishops don't believe, some priests do believe, some priests don't believe. Most of them want to have nothing to do with it. They know little, and they want to know less. Thank you, my friend, and have a good rest. God bless you. Take care. Uh, Dr. Malachi Martin.